Between March 1943 and February 1944, 43 Allied secret agents were smuggled by aircraft into German-occupied France. Their task was to create chaos behind enemy lines. Sabotage, assassination, and mayhem. Everyone knew it was a dangerous job, but they didn't know how dangerous. Their entire network had been penetrated by the Germans. Waiting for them would be the Gestapo, the German secret police. Hundreds would die, either shot or hanged in the Nazis' prison camps. But the puzzle was, how had this happened? Why had this network collapsed so badly? Were they victims of their own lax security? This was an example of bad luck as well as bad management, I think. Or was it because of this man, Henri Derricourt, who some still believe to be a double agent. When I saw him, my heart sank. I felt that uh, he wasn't a man that I would trust. But there is another, even more sinister possibility. That Derek Hall may have betrayed these agents not because he was working for the Germans, but for another rival British intelligence agency. Did all these people die because they just wanted them out of the way. The colleague of mine recalls with horror Claude Dancy rubbing his hands with delight that one of the SOE networks had broken down. This is the extraordinary story of Henri Delicor. A double, or was he a triple agent? And his role in one of the biggest intelligence blunders of World War II. Derek Hall was one of hundreds of refugees arriving in Britain. He had got there thanks to an escape route organised by MI6, the Secret Intelligence Service, also known as SIS. Derek Hall had told them he had been a pilot for Air France. And even claimed that in 1936, British intelligence had invited him to fly for them. This, however, was a lie. Derricor had never been approached by SIS. They swiftly unpicked his story. But instead of treating him with suspicion, they recommended him to another secret organisation. It would be the first of a string of strange interventions by SIS in the mysterious saga of Henri Derricor. SIS had recommended Derricourt to SOE. The Special Operations Executive had been set up by Churchill himself. Their role, he said, was to set Europe ablaze. Their calling card was espionage, sabotage and assassination. Their task was to wage a covert war in the heart of enemy territory. SOE's biggest area of operations was France. As the war progressed, it built up a formidable series of networks across the country, involving hundreds of resistance fighters. Every occupied country had a country section in SOE, preferably staffed by people who knew something about the country, had been there, spoke its language, and had tentacles out both to people still in the country and to the government in exile, if there was one, as there usually was in London. Hello, F section. In charge of French operations was SOE's F section, run by Maurice Buckmaster. 
Buckmaster, like many of SOE's senior figures, owed his position as much to his social connections as to his abilities. In his youth, he had attended the elite public school, Eton College, and later became a businessman. But he had few obvious skills to run a major covert operation. It could only recruit in those very early stages on the old point net. People who'd been at school with you, people who'd been at university with you, you, know, you knew whether they could hold their, hold their tongues, whether they would make good secret agents or whether they would make good secret staff officers or not. Buckmaster had a very immediate problem. SOE agents were ferried in and out of northern France by special squadrons of RAF Lysanders. But these planes could not land just anywhere. And SOE's agents in northern France were repeatedly failing to provide proper landing sites. The RAF warned Buckmaster that they would have to cancel their flights. Some of the landing grounds that had been selected by untrained uh, people, resistance people, proved to be very boggy or the, the plane got stuck in them or else they, they had a tree growing up in the middle of the, the landing place or whatever, uh, totally unsuitable. As Buckmaster wrestled with the problem of how to fly in Lysanders, Pericor appeared. I was informed of him as being one of the relatively few Frenchmen who knew enough about uh, aircraft manoeuvring to realize what uh, a kind of a landing ground was necessary for Lysander or Hudson. Vera Atkins was one of Buckmaster's closest assistants. She was less keen on Derrick Hall. The people who had seen him all were um, very much impressed with him. And uh, I was sent down to see him. And um, when I saw him, my heart sank because I felt that uh, he wasn't a man that I would trust. But Derek Hoare had a trump card. He knew Buckmaster's number two, Nicholas Boddington. They had met in Paris before the war. When Boddington heard he was in London, he said, we'll have this chap. He's a pretty good pilot and will be a great deal of use to us. So his arrival in SOE was more or less automatic. And so the man who SIS knew had faked his story became SOE's air movements officer for the north of France. He would now arrange and secure all passage of agents and equipment in and out of the country. And soon, he and SOE would be very busy indeed. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin made it clear that he was fed up with fighting the Nazis on his own. He demanded that Britain and America open up a second front in Western Europe. Das vor Bir Hachheim, der südlichste Eckpfeiler des britischen Verteidigungssystems in Nordafrika, ist genommen. But the Western Allies were locked in a bitter military stalemate with the Germans in North Africa. They didn't have the forces in place to open a second front in Europe. And they wouldn't until at least 1944. But Churchill and Roosevelt felt that they had to do something. Could they at least tie down German troops in the West so that they weren't sent to fight Stalin? And so they devised an ingenious deception plan named Cockade. Operation Cockade was nothing less than a fake invasion of France. To make this deception all the more convincing, SOE was ordered to ramp up its campaigns in northern France. It was told the invasion was for real and would happen in November 1943. 
so SOE began dropping more and more equipment into France. One of the main recipients of SOE's equipment was the so-called Prosper Network. Prosper had been set up in October 1942. It had links to hundreds of resistance cells and with 1,500 members was SOE's biggest operation in France. Its leader was Francis Suttle, whose codename was also Prosper. He used the prospect of the Second Front to galvanize his network. Among them was Jacques Biroux. Fundamental to the success of the Prosper Network's new mission was SOE's new air movements officer, Henri Derricon. That January, Buckmaster's F section had dropped him into France to set up reliable landing sites. He made his way to Paris, and there he organized the comings and goings of Allied agents in and out of the country. There were two or three cafes in Paris. If you said the right code word to the barman, he would put you in touch with Jericho. Jericho would come to the cafe, would look you over, the further exchange of passwords, if he was satisfied that you were an F agent, he would tell you when to turn up at which railway station. In a matter of weeks, Derricor successfully transported 22 agents in and out of occupied France. Thanks to Derricor, Prosper was on the move. They had a dozen hideouts, 33 dropping grounds, and had received 254 containers of equipment. The network conducted some 63 acts of sabotage. Derailing trains, killing 43 Germans, and wounding 110. But all this activity attracted the Germans. They were soon scouring the countryside looking for Prosper's agents. This attention started causing problems for another secret British operation, the Secret Intelligence Service, or SIS. From its base in London, SIS was also heavily involved in subversion in France. But its job was very different to SOE's. While SOE was all about creating chaos, SIS operated by stealth. Its role was the gathering of intelligence, quietly collecting information on enemy troop movements and numbers. The last thing SIS agents in the field needed was lots of Germans blundering around looking for spies. SIS couldn't help presenting the existence of SOE for one excellent professional reason. While SOE's agents were doing any good, raising mayhem, they called, of course, for a great deal of enemy police attention, therefore made life much trickier for any SIS agents who might be in the neighborhood. Prosper's activities especially angered one senior SIS officer. The French section of SIS was headed by a very powerful man who was also the assistant chief of the Secret Service, um, Colonel Claude Dancy, later Sir Claude Dancy. And uh, Dancy was really very hostile, both to subversion, which he felt created an interference with the intelligence gathering operation. But for some reason, which I'm not quite clear about, he seemed very hostile to the, to the French too. And then came an event that would bring SIS and Derricourt together for the first time since 1940. Alisander almost crashed on landing in France. 
one of my pallets flew through a small tree just before touching down. And I thought that Derek had laid the flare path too close to this tree. So I had him brought back to England to tear him off a strip. And also I thought maybe to give him a bit of a rest. I thought perhaps he was beginning to suffer from operational fatigue. That was in April 43. Derekor was recalled by SOE to Baker Street to explain the incident. During this trip, it seems he may also have visited the headquarters of SIS. It is now known that Henri Derekor told SIS something that should have horrified them. The man so trusted by SOE revealed he had close links with the Gestapo, the German secret police. It all went back to his days in Paris before the war. There, Derricourt had not just met SOE's Nicholas Boddington, he had also met Karl Bermelberg. Bermelberg was now the Gestapo's counterintelligence chief in Paris, and he was running Derricourt very cleverly. Before each flight, Derricor would notify Bermelberg of the time and place of each journey. Bermelberg would then contact the Luftwaffe to ensure the flight had safe passage. Then rather than arrest the agents as they landed, Bermelberg had them followed. And so, he could gather more and more information about the Prosper network while Derricor could claim he had never actively betrayed any agents. Derricor was also in charge of SOE mail, bound for Britain from all over France. Before he sent it to London, he took it to a building on the Avenue Foch, Bermelberg's headquarters. The mail was a treasure trove of intelligence. It contained messages too long to be sent by wireless. Even descriptions and plans of sabotage targets. The truth was that the Prosper network in France had been severely compromised by the Gestapo. Derricourt was now running air movements in and out of France for SOE. He was supplying SOE intelligence to the Germans and he was reporting secretly to SIS. He was a triple agent. Utterly ignorant of all this, SOE sent Derricourt back into France to continue his work. On the 16th of June 1943, another Lysander landed in France. On board were four more agents, all part of SOE's effort to step up activities as part of cockade. The agents were met by Henri Derricot. Among them was a young woman, codenamed Madeleine. Nor Inyat Khan was just 29 years old. Nor Inyat Khan was a direct descendant of Tipu Sultan, who'd been a sharp thorn in the side of the East India Company at the end of the 18th century. She was an Indian princess. Noor had been raised in Paris and, like Derricourt, had fled to England at the outbreak of war, where she had volunteered for the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. But her fluent French soon drew her to the attention of SOE. She was summoned for interview and was snapped up by F section of SOE, which was very short of wireless operators. Noor was sent on a brief but intensive SOE training program, after which she was considered ready for active service in France. Many felt she wasn't up to the job. I think it was a great mistake to send her. She was quite unfit for the clandestine struggle. After being met by Derricourt in France, Noor made her way to her home city of Paris and went to an agreed rendezvous point. 
There she made contact with the Prosper Network's leader, Francis Suttle. Within days of reaching Paris, she was transmitting to London. But despite the successful start to her mission, the Prosper Network would be destroyed within weeks. On the 21st of June, Bermelberg struck. Two Canadian agents were arrested. In the boot of their car was their wireless and several uncoded messages for members of the Prosper Network. In the glove box were the addresses for three more Prosper members. Within days, the addresses were raided and they too were arrested. The next day, Subtle, Prosper himself, was arrested by Bermelberg's men. Another SOE radio operator, Gilbert Norman, was also captured along with his transmitter. The Germans now used that radio to contact London, pretending to be Norman. But they did not put in his security check. A secret code, meant to be in every message he sent, which would tell SOE in London that he was safe. But incredibly, F section failed to react to the omission of his security check. Instead, Buckmaster replied, ordering Norman to provide his missing check in his next transmission. It was only when SOE received word from Noor Eniad Khan's radio that they finally realized that the Prosper network was in jeopardy. One by one, the Prosper network was destroyed and some 400 members were arrested. Their fate would only become clear after the war. By mid-July, Noor Eniad Khan was F section's sole remaining radio operator in Paris. So head of F section Maurice Buckmaster ordered Noor to return to Britain. But she refused. Buckmaster, even though he knew that Prosper was in trouble, accepted her decision. Her staying would seal her fate. On the 22nd of July, F section sent two men to France to find out if anything could be salvaged from the Prosper network. One was Derricourt's old friend, Buckmaster's deputy, Nicholas Boddington. The other was a radio operator, Jack Agazarian. That night, Henri Derricourt met them from the Hudson aircraft as it landed north of Angers. Boddington and Agazarian travelled to Paris. From a safe house, they tapped out messages to other operators in the city, hoping for some kind of response. On the 29th of July, they got one. But it came from the radio of Gilbert Norman. Both Boddington and Agazarian knew that Norman was transmitting without his radio check. So was he in fact still free, but on the run? Or was it a trap? In an extraordinarily reckless decision, they decided that one of them should go and meet him. But which one? They tossed a coin. Agazarian lost. The next day, he went to the meeting place. He did not return. Boddington now turned to Derricourt to arrange his return to England. Derricourt then revealed that he would be able to get Boddington back to London by arranging his safe conduct 
through Luftwaffe airspace. This was the first time anyone from SOE's head office knew that Derricourt had contact with the German military. But Boddington seemed unconcerned by the implications. Instead, on the night of the 17th of August, Boddington returned to Britain by Lysander. On his arrival in London, he told Buckmaster about Derricourt's links with the Luftwaffe. But that whatever had gone wrong with Prosper, it certainly had nothing to do with Derricourt. Buckmaster, it seems, believed Boddington unquestioningly. Fourteen years later, in 1958, he gave an interview to the BBC's John Freeman about the very subject. Freeman refers to Derricourt as Gilbert, while he calls Nicholas Boddington Major X. First of all, when Major X returned to London in August 1943, did he tell you what he'd found out about Gilbert and what he'd told Gilbert? Uh, yes, he told us that uh, Gilbert had contacts with the Germans. Uh, that was regarded as being uh, a, possibly a useful thing. So you at that stage approved? At that stage. On the 13th of October, the Gestapo finally caught up with Noor Eniat Khan. When she was arrested, her inexperience as a spy was evident. The Germans simply put a corporal in her room and arrested her and found in her bedside table a school notebook was recorded in it on facing pages every telegram she'd ever sent in clear on one page and in cipher on the other. Bermelberg's deputy, Hans Kiefer, began playing what the Germans called the radio game, or Funkspiel. They used Noor's captured transmitter to send bogus messages to SOE headquarters in London. Noor, forced to send some of these messages herself, tried to warn London. Her first message read that Madeleine is in hospital. That was code for captured, or at the very least, in danger. But once again, F section head, Maurice Buckmaster, ignored the warning. Two weeks later, F section began receiving yet more messages from Noor's radio. But these messages did not contain Noor's security check. But again, Buckmaster ignored the warning, with terrible consequences. Buckmaster said, I don't believe you. The traffic sounds perfectly authentic to me, and we're going to go on sending to her. And they sent not only messages, but men. They sent three of the best agents in SOE, to a drop organised by her, who were, of course, handcuffed on their landing ground in January 44. Pity. When the truth finally dawned in London, the SOE's head, Colonel Gordon Gubbins, launched an inquiry. Had SOE been incompetent? Or had the Prosper Network or even SOE's headquarters been penetrated? In the course of his investigation, Gubbins found out something that puzzled him. Derricourt had had contact with SIS. It was the first SOE had heard about this. On the 8th of February 1944, Derricourt and his wife left France for England. In London, Buckmaster confronted him. Group Captain Hugh Verity joined the meeting. We all three sat in comfortable armchairs and after a little bit of chat, Morris Buckmaster confronted Derricourt with the accusation that he'd been working with the Germans in Paris. I must say I was really astonished at how deadpan Derricourt was. He didn't seem to 
react to that with any emotion at all. He simply explained that uh, to do his job for F section efficiently, he had to be on pretty good terms with the, with the German authorities in Paris and, in fact, uh, supplied them with black market oranges. Buckmaster went back to Claude Dancy, demanding information about Dericourt's links with the Gestapo. But SIS would not tell SOE anything. So SOE were forced to conclude that Dericourt had no case to answer. He was off the hook. But his days of working for SOE were over. When the war ended, Dericourt returned to the land of his birth. There he resumed his pre-war job as a pilot. In November 1946, he was arrested by the French authorities on a charge of supplying intelligence to the enemy. On the 7th of June 1948, Dericourt came to trial in Paris. His defense was based on two facts. Not one single agent's arrest could be attributed to him. And that he had transported 110 agents safely through his channels. The star witness at his trial was SOE's deputy head of F section, Dericourt's old friend, Nicholas Boddington. But Boddington was not appearing for the prosecution, but for the defense. He told the court of his total trust in Dericourt. At the end of the trial, Dericourt was acquitted and hailed a hero of the resistance. He was a free man. So what is the truth about Dericourt and the Prosper Network? One possibility is that Dericourt was actually telling the truth. He may have had links with the Germans, but these had actually helped him get SOE agents in and out of France. And he never actually betrayed any agents at all. If so, the real reason for the Prosper Network's collapse may simply have been incompetence on the part of SOE. It is certainly clear that Buckmaster and some of his team were not up to their jobs. In spite of his remark about Nuri Layat and not wanting him over laden with brains, he wasn't over laden with brains himself. He was nothing like as bright as the men he was combating. Yet it seems doubtful that even the blunders committed by Buckmaster's SOE could be solely to blame for what happened. Dericourt was, after all, giving information to the Gestapo chief Karl Bermelberg by letting him read SOE's mail. It seems highly likely that this at least had something to do with the Prosper Network's fate. If so, then Buckmaster and Boddington were guilty of another form of incompetence. They knew about Dericourt's dealings with the Luftwaffe. This should have rung alarm bells, but it didn't. In the 1958 interview, John Freeman asked Buckmaster some more direct questions. Again, Dericourt is referred to as Gilbert. Well, now, if you knew that Gilbert was a double agent, which you seem to have done in August 1943, weren't you taking a terrible risk with the lives of your own people? Because, after all, double agents have to give some value to both sides, and you did, in fact, have very heavy casualties in your section during the time that Gilbert was your air movement officer. Yes, but, uh, the, the, but when Gilbert was, working, was doing this operation, he carried out a whole series of operations, perfectly successfully and satisfactorily, which indicated that he was doing a job which would, couldn't, in fact, be done by anybody else. It's still true that your major network was captured at that time, wasn't it? One of the major networks, yes. But even if SOE was incompetent, there was one highly able British organisation that had long known of Dericourt's links with the Germans. SIS. 
So why might SIS have failed to tip off their colleagues at SOV? Certainly the two agencies were rivals. Dancy and the SIS saw themselves as true professionals, but they regarded SOE as gung-ho amateurs. Dancy was always strongly antagonistic to SOE. I have never very clearly understood why, but whatever the reason was, uh, he used to refer to the boys of Baker Street and those amateurs, and you know, always in an extremely scornful and offensive way. There is no doubt that Dancy was alarmed by the huge increase of activity undertaken by Prosper as part of Cocade. The SOE's acts of sabotage and the German response imperiled their own more covert spying activities. So have they let Delacour betray SOE just to get their rivals out of the way, while at the same time using him to gather information about the Gestapo? It seems preposterous. There is a myth that he was a double agent planted in SOE by SIS, which there's no need to believe. SIS didn't need a double agent in SOE. Claude Dancy had a desk in Baker Street, was SIS's official liaison officer with SOE, and saw the whole of SOE's wireless traffic every day, in and out. He didn't need a spy in SOE. However, the idea that Dancy might have let Dericor betray SOE is not quite so absurd. After the war, Dancy's assistant heard a strange story. A colleague of mine working in SIS recalls with horror how he came upon Claude Dancy rubbing his hands with delight and feeling that this must be some lost German loss and was horrified to discover that this, in fact, was that one of the SOE networks had broken down. Was Dancy's glee the joy of a man who had been secretly working for SOE's downfall? Was Dericor working against SOE for both the Germans and SIS? One man who could have answered that was Henri Dericor himself. But on the 21st of November, 1962, a plane flown by Dericor crashed in Laos. All the occupants were burned beyond recognition. The cause of the crash was unknown, but with his death, Dericor took the truth about his role in the fall of Prosper to the grave. The consequences of the Prosper affair and Dericor's role as a double or triple agent can only be measured in lives. In April 1945, the Allies liberated the Nazi concentration camps. There, the fate of the Prosper network was at last revealed. Dozens of its members, including Francis Suttle, Gilbert Norman, and Jack Agazarian, have been sent to concentration camps and executed. In all, over 400 people linked to Prosper were arrested. Many had suffered horrific torture and execution. Among the most poignant stories was that of Noor Iniat Khan. The only word she said before being shot was, Liberté. For her bravery during the war, Noor Iniat Khan was posthumously awarded the French Croix de Guerre and the George Medal.